Okay, so thanks for again for joining me. Um, again, my name is Lindsay Breland. Y'all can call me Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her. And um, we're going to be talking about navigating tensions and talking about hot moments in the classroom and really thinking about how do we prepare for them? Because I think a lot of uh, navigating these moments is those of us that are the, you know, uh, instructional faculty preparing ourselves mentally for these moments that are upcoming, preparing our students for these moments that are upcoming and figuring out ways to uh, to handle them in class in a way that feels respectful, but is also going to not diminish people's feelings um, or the importance of, of the conversation. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. And then also talking about how to repair uh, relationships and trust after maybe something big has happened. Um, that can happen. Again, I've been teaching um, gender and sexuality studies. So some of the topics that might seem um, like basic, quote unquote, basic like feminist topics, like talking about abortion. Some people have very strong opinions about it. Some people have a personal relationship to it. Some people have religious beliefs to it uh, attached to that. And it can be really hard to talk about these things in a way that uh, doesn't bump up against somebody in, in a difficult way. Um, and those moments where we're challenged and we're encouraged to think about something differently, that's part of learning. Um, but it's also uncomfortable and it can be really uncomfortable when we have um, students in our classes that feel like they're the only ones who are being challenged and that they're being put on trial or that they're not being respected because of what they believe to be true about a, an experience or what is true to them about a, a topic or experience. Okay. Um, so again, um, I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator here at CITL um, and I'll be sending out my contact information after this. So today we're gonna be talking about uh, the signs of escalating tensions, um, how we're going to work on communication skills, uh, not only personally, but again, as a class. Um, it's really important that we are modeling the behavior, but we're also setting our students up knowing that, okay, if we're, uh, if we're having these tensions, if we have these hot moments, this is how we're going to be talking to each other. This is how we're going to be dealing with it um, to make sure that we as a class have an understanding of, of respect. It's important for us as you know, instructional faculty and as facilitators of these conversations to, um, to have tools, but we also wanna share these tools with students. And then we're gonna also talk about uh, creating an inclusive classroom culture and again, part of that is having challenging conversations. Part of that is uh, listening to diverse perspectives, um, especially when they might be coming, even if they're not uh, the perspectives uh, that most of the people in class have, they might be coming from very personal places. And so we wanna make sure that we're giving space for that too. So here are some basics about hot moments um hot moments uh that's what that's what uh, a lot of us are calling and that's what i'm calling uh just instances of tension and conflict in the classroom uh it doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing um conflict and having intense discussions are those are all fine things to be happening in the classroom um, especially if we're working against this model of our students being um, little listeners that we talk at and they just soak up the information. If they're thinking critically, if they're applying concepts to their lives, if they're uh, bringing parts of their themselves into the classroom, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be um, moments of tension, and that's good because we're learning. Um, Tension happens when we're learning, whether it's, uh, again, gender and sexuality courses or even math. 
Um, there's going to be some tension when you feel like you're you don't understand what's going on and there's going to be some discomfort. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of students coming into higher education that because of political climate, they have not been talking about topics that are potentially hot. So they're not talking about oppression, they're not talking about race, they're not talking about LGBTQ rights. Um, so they haven't practiced how to have these conversations in a way that is productive. So it's more likely to get into a space that is very tense and possibly not productive, uh, possibly personal insults or raising voices or whatever, because it hasn't been uh, modeled for them and they haven't practiced. Um, and again, political topics uh, are probably coming up, are going to continue to come up, uh, have been coming up for ever um, in our classrooms, but these things are, are connected deeply to personal stuff. So we can't expect to just talk about a law and have it just hang there and have people not think about uh, people that are, are connected to that thing. And I think that that's really um, a benefit if we're thinking about the humanity of what is happening. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but no one wants to feel wrong about what they believe or what they've experienced and no one wants to be dehumanized. So it can be tricky to talk about uh, different topics without, again, bumping up against that. Um, and talking and thinking critically about challenging topics, really, it creates change uh, on the personal level, but it could also create change for us as professionals when we engage in these conversations. It could also create changes for our institution. So if we're willing to have conversations that might be difficult, if we're willing to engage in um conversation that might be about topics that are taboo, but we're thinking about how they connect to our students, to our own lives, to higher education in general. Uh, this is how things change and change for the better. So it's important to have these hot moments, but again, we have to know how to uh, navigate them in a way that everybody feels uh, comfortable. So we're gonna talk about building and preparing um, our class for these hot moments? How do we anticipate and intervene? And then how do we rebuild and reflect? So um, we're, uh, you know, a month into the semester. So building and preparing is probably not something that we're necessarily going to be doing this minute, but we can, um, we can go back and, and do some of these things still, even if it's not the first week of class. But ideally, in the beginning of the semester, you're going to set expectations for student participation and how um, how you're expecting them to behave in in discussions, but how also they expect uh, the whole class to behave. So um, I highly recommend creating community agreements. So as a class, you come together and create the norms and the expectations. So there are some things that you might say, um, you know, that you might have some hard beliefs that uh, that you want to make sure that everybody understands, like this is uh, something that we absolutely cannot do. Um, we're in a lab. You cannot be eating and drinking in this room. It's not safe. Fine. Um, but there might be some things that students uh, think are important that they want to build into uh, class or the community agreements. Um, I will often have students that want to uh, create the norm of raising your hand when you're speaking or before you speak. Um, and depending on the class size or what the setup is, maybe that doesn't really make sense. Maybe that creates more tension. Maybe that puts uh, the instructor at a in a situation where they have more power than they really need during discussions. So that could even be something where they create agreements based off of what they expect a classroom 
to look like and how they expect it to be run. And that might be a larger conversation about, well, is this about respect or is this about what you believe a classroom should look like? And is that actually respectful? Um, but creating these agreements together really can bring um, students together in community. It can build trust, especially if you're having them work in like small groups and then share back in, in large groups. I mean, if you have a classroom of 20 students, um, you might create them all together and have a large group discussion the entire time. Um, but community agreements can work for any size of class. Um, and, and students really play a role in shaping the classroom community and thinking about what they expect from themselves and what they expect from others moving forward in the class. It sets up this expectation of we're going to be engaging um, with everybody else. We're going to be thinking about these topics. We're going to be talking about these topics or writing about them or reflecting about them in some sort of way. And they understand what is going to be coming up rather than just reading like classroom norms listed on a syllabus. Um, I always identify non-negotiables in my syllabus. Um, I'll send out this language specifically to all of you because um, I always get those, those questions. Um, and you can use this exact language if you want to. You could uh, edit it. Um, or you could say that's ridiculous and I'm not using that at all. Um, nothing hurts my feelings, but I always identify non-negotiables. So what are very uh, core things that I believe um, are necessary in order for us to work together in an environment? So sort of like house rules, um, that you would have for a class. And it's possible that you would, you know, share these with students and that you could edit them together. Um, but I always include statements in my syllabus about focusing on humanity. I think that's very, very important. Um, and also avoiding uh, di divisive language or um, if there's particular language that is um, hate speech or, uh, racially charged, um, then we might talk about that too. Um, and this isn't about hurting students who accidentally use language that they might not understand, but it's about creating an expectation of um, we're going to be having hard conversations and we're responsible for what we say and what we do. Um, so, for example, I uh, put in my syllabus, we will not be debating the right of anyone to exist or have rights based off of gender, sexuality, race, ability, nationality, or any other identity. If you have questions or want to engage in a discussion about these identities or human rights, please contact me directly. I've had a lot of classes with uh, trans students whose um, rights to exist or to have health care or uh, to be members of society have been uh, criticized and debated in ways that um, often feel dehumanizing because they're sitting in the classroom with everybody else. Um, it's not some, uh, you know, person that is is uh, so far removed from the classroom that we we can um, talk about them in a way that, uh, that we don't have to worry about the humanity, I guess. Um, so when students have questions about things, they can talk to me directly. I can point them towards uh, resource centers or um, we can engage in conversations or debates or whatever that is. One-on-one, uh, -on -one, I can share resources, but we're not gonna have those conversations in class. Um, same thing with divisive language. Uh, I've had a lot of students write about um, about immigration, about documentation, um, about laws that have to do uh, with borders. And so we will often, we will, I will often uh, 
encounters people talking about quote unquote illegals um, or uh, using language that is is not accurate and is often offensive in the way that it's used. And so I will outright say like, if this is a topic that we're talking about, if this is something that we are going to be thinking about, um, this language isn't okay and have that standard set from the beginning. Um, and students can also uh, create non-negotiables together and we can add that to the expectations of, no, we're not gonna say this language. Um, no, this is, this is not going to fly in this classroom. This is where we can answer questions or have these conversations elsewhere. One of the things that really helps students prepare for having conversations about difficult topics um, is sharing content warnings. So I'm not saying that uh, this has to be done perfectly. I'm not saying that students necessarily get out of um, engaging in different topics or or talking about or participating in um, in class things uh, because of of content warnings but if they know that something is going to come up about a topic that again they might be vulnerable about they might have personal beliefs um, they can they can prepare for that um, they can prepare their thoughts. If we're going to be watching a video in class and responding to it, and it's going to be talking about something like abortion, um, it's helpful to let students know the class before, like, hey, we're going to be covering this. Um, this is going to be come up. This is going to come up. This is what I'm hoping you're going to get from this video, but it also has this other stuff. Um, and so it creates a sense of trust with you and your students, but uh, they're less likely to be reactive and um, they're more likely to think critically about something. They're more likely to come in prepared to engage uh, with the things that you want them to engage with. Uh, but also having big feelings is is OK. Um, so creating a space for them to. Uh, to have those big feelings outside of what you were hoping to accomplish for the day, that's also very useful. Um, supporting LGBTQ plus students, um, I think that this is maybe something that I am, you know, particularly sensitive to and um, passionate about, but creating an environment where queer, queer and trans students' voices are, um, they're valued, there's space for them to uh, to talk and for their identities to be shared is really important. Um, not having classrooms where we, uh, if we don't think anybody looks, quote unquote, looks uh, queer or trans, we're not talking like they um, are in the space or that they, um, that we are all uh, have the same identities. Um, and this is really important, obviously, if you're going to be talking about gender or sexual sexuality or identity, um, if you're going to be talking about politics and you're going to be talking about laws, um, these things are so intertwined with uh, with what's going on. Um, it's really important to make sure that you are uh, taking care of your students um, and are demonstrating support, whether it's by um, using proper pronouns, um, acknowledging that, you know, queer and trans people exist. Um, sometimes it's very basic things that can uh, really demonstrate to students that you uh, actively care and there's a space for them to talk. Um, so, Anticipating and intervening in class um, when something happens that turns hot. Again, I don't know that uh, hot is necessarily um, a bad thing in our class because it can be very productive. Um, but we want to make sure that we are monitoring that, 
that we're aware of, of what's happening and that students are also aware of what's happening because they're part of the community. Um, we're teaching adults and so they can take on roles within the classroom where they're responsible um, for helping make sure that things don't um, escalate in a way that is is really, really difficult to come back from. Um, so I like to use the oops, ouch, woe protocol. Um, I'll be sending out information about this uh, also at the end of the presentation. But this creates a common language to destigmatize uh, asking for clarity or identifying uh, harm. So uh, we use three terms, oops, ouch, and woe. Um, and it's a way to sort of pause the conversation and um, reflect on what's being said or giving a, somebody a chance to clarify themselves instead of it blowing up into something that is uh, bigger. So you might use ouch to pause the conversation when somebody is saying something problematic or hurtful. Um, again, people talk and um, sometimes they're not thinking critically about what they're saying, especially if they feel like they have to respond to something in the moment. Um, so saying ouch gives a chance to uh, pause and say, oh, hey, that language is, that hurt my feelings, that uh, language is hurtful towards um, this group of people or this identity or whatever it might be. And you get a chance to sort of uh, cool down, recognize that maybe um, there's a different way of going about having that conversation and we don't have to derail the entire conversation. We can just hit pause and then we can go back, um, clarify, make corrections, and then continue on with that conversation. Um, you would use oops when something, when somebody says something wrong. Um, so that's a way for you to sort of hit pause and say, oops, I, I need to say that again because that's not what I was trying to communicate. That was a bad word that I used. This uh, came off in a way that I'm not happy with. Um, and, or if you need to say, oops, I'm trying to communicate something along these lines, but I'm not sure how to say it in a way um, that doesn't sound offensive, that doesn't sound um, problematic, that doesn't sound like I am uh, dehumanizing this group of people. Like, can we, can we think about this in a different way? Um, so it gives you a chance to sort of uh, demonstrate to people that you're um, that you're being mindful, but you maybe uh, need more time to think about what you need to say or um, that you need help with saying what you need to say. And then woe is an opportunity to ask somebody to slow down and clarify what they're saying. Um, so if people are making large statements about um, about uh, Palestinians, for example, um, you might have them say, or you might say, whoa, can you slow down? Like, where, where's that information coming from? Um, it's also a chance for everybody to sort of maybe uh, think critically about um, sources that they're using for, for information. Where are they collecting uh, the, the data that they're using or um, the personal stories that they're using to talk about in class. Um, and sometimes you'll say, whoa, where is that coming from? And a person will say, well, this is my direct experience. And it gives you, again, a chance to humanize what's going on. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll send out that guide to uh, that sort of breaks that down and gives you some examples. Um, creating a brave space. We've talked a lot about um, in the last, oh gosh, I don't know, 15 years um, more talking about creating safe spaces. Um, not every space is going to be safe and not every space is um, productive if it's safe. 
Um, so maybe your office is a safe space, but the classroom can't necessarily be one. So creating a brave space where students can um, share ideas and ask questions in a supportive environment that they can say, um, I'm not sure how I feel about this thing. Um, this is what I'm thinking, but I don't think that's right. Like, can we have a conversation about that? And recognizing that they're going to not know everything, that they might make mistakes, um, and that students might be exposed to ideas that make them uncomfortable. Um, and that's going to be OK. Um, again, we don't want things escalating to a point where it's personal attacks or dehumanizing anybody um, using hate speech, but uh, acknowledging that there are other ideas out there, acknowledging that other people have different experiences that might be uncomfortable for people. Um, they might not want to uh, engage with that, but we can do that in a safe um, well, I don't want to say a safe environment. We can do that in a supportive environment where uh, they're being looked after by uh, their classmates as well as you. Um, and I keep on talking about this, focusing on the humanity of the topic. So um, who is impacted by the thing we're talking about? If we're talking about um, I keep going back to abortion, but that's something that um, is is sort of everywhere on my um, social media, especially people talking about um, Roe v. Wade and talking about um, abortion and health care for people that are pregnant. Um, and so if we are um, zooming out and we're talking about the topic just as uh, something that is right or wrong, that might be really hard. But if we can zoom in and we can think about the individuals who have been, been impacted by it, maybe even individuals in the class that want to share their experiences or um, their connections, that can really help us think through things. Um, maybe people don't change their opinions, but they also maybe understand a little bit more why um, by other people believe other things. Um, and it helps people in the classroom connect. Um, again, even if you don't have the same beliefs, you can still create understanding, you can still create an environment where people are willing to listen to each other. Um, and there can be a sense of care for each other and for um, individuals' beliefs and struggles, even if you don't believe everything uh, exactly the same in the classroom. Um, and so last, I want to talk about rebuilding and reflecting. Um, it can be really easy to uh, shut a student down when they say or do something um, that's not appropriate, um, whether it reflects something that um, you believe or experience or that is true to you, or if you see them, you know, hurting another student, it can be really difficult to shut it down, dismiss the student, and create an environment where they're not going to open up or um, share anymore. They don't feel comfortable uh, in the space. And so we want to make sure that. Um, we don't set a precedent for that. Uh, obviously, it, inappropriate behavior is inappropriate, and we want to make sure that we are acknowledging that. Um, but we're in environments where we're learning and not just complying with um, the beliefs of the uh, instructor. So we want to make sure that if something goes awry, um, students get a chance to uh, think critically about what happened, to um, apologize, that they're not put in a situation where it's like, well, I can't talk anymore because I'm going to say the wrong thing. Um, and that can be something addressed as, as, a, as a group, again. Um, 
and acknowledge like, oh yeah, that was, that was hard. Um, let's think about ways that we can avoid something like that happening in the future. Do we want to write uh, for five minutes before we engage in in-class discussions about these topics? Do we want to do um, X, Y, Z things um, in order to avoid uh, a moment like that that caused a lot of tension and potentially hurt? Um, so it becomes a, a moment in your class where you uh, can, you know, acknowledge like something stinks um, and you don't like that and uh, you can get over it together. Um, you know, you have relationships with the the community as a whole, but you also have relationships with each individual student and they have relationships with each other. And we want to make sure that we're not creating an environment where we're um, sticking somebody out in the cold for the rest of the semester um, because they made a mistake. Um, and when trust is broken, we can repair that. So um, acknowledging what went wrong, uh, having students share their feelings when something hurts or uh, was really scary um, and validating those feelings. And then also, again, like saying, okay, this is what we're going to do in the future. Um, individuals that maybe uh, hurt others might commit to new behavior, but you can also commit to new behavior as a community as well. Um, so again, it might just be uh, hitting the pause button when things get too heated, taking five minutes, letting students like walk outside, uh, get a get a drink, um, write reflectively for a little bit, and then coming back to a topic. And some of us will be teaching, um, and these topics won't necessarily be something that's related directly to what we're trying to accomplish for the day. Um, so you might hit the pause button. You might have them uh, do some sort of cool down reflective activity, and then you might move on with something else. Uh, and that's okay too. You can still let students feel and still give them an opportunity to feel validated for feeling. But it doesn't have to be something that's uh, super tense or uncomfortable in the classroom in order for that to happen. So maybe those are one-on-one -on -one conversations. Maybe it's them writing a little journal um, or even creating a little uh, audio file or video file after the class and sharing that with you in some space like Blackboard. And you just acknowledging, you know, like, yeah, that was hard. I'm sorry that that um, felt like that to you and just validating them and trying to create that, um, repair that trust and acknowledge that you are, um, that you care about them and about how they feel and their comfort in the classroom. So I've been talking a lot at you. I want to make sure we get a chance to, um, to hear from you all. So I'm curious if you have any questions, but also are there some ways that you've handled hot moments or that you've witnessed other people handle them? I mean, hot moments can 100% happen in, uh, in department meetings, in um, workshops, in um, conference presentations. There's been a lot of hot moments that I've um, sat through, unfortunately, maybe fortunately. Um, so are there some ways that you uh, handled them or you witness other people handle them? Um, and I'm curious if there's some challenges that you've encountered with hot moments in your own uh, classrooms or in other um, spaces, maybe even as a student yourself. Uh, feel free to type in the chat that you are also very welcome to turn on your mic and share that way. Yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, I've got a question and sorry, I've got to leave in a few minutes. So I thought I'd jump in and, and give you the question right away if you don't mind. Um, so when I'm thinking about like a classroom space, oftentimes I have 
time to like build trust and rapport with students, but maybe for like, I'm thinking about writer's workshop specifically for events and stuff where I don't have that kind of rapport necessarily with students, but I'm still trying to make an inclusive environment. Do you have any recommendations for how to kind of deal with hot moments in that sort of space where trust isn't necessarily there as much? Yeah, yeah, I wonder, um... Are you thinking about like your open mic stuff or are you? Thinking yeah, absolutely. About... Yeah, okay. open mics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I was like, is there something else going on? Um, I was just invited to the open mic. So I was wondering, okay. So um, yeah, what something that I would consider is sort of at the beginning of the event, um, talking about intentions and sort of, you know, like maybe creating some like, very short community agreements based off of that. Maybe it's an interactive thing where as people are coming in, you have something on the board where they can um, write about, again, an intention or an agreement about being in that space. Um, you might also use the, um, what is it called? The grows method. Um, I don't, it's not a method. It's, it, I'll send it to you. But you might have seen it in other workshops at NAU, but it's basically like talking about um, it's an acronym that's talking about like uh, creating respect in the space. Like you learn, um, you take the things that you've learned, but not like sharing personal experiences, sort of like how can we be vulnerable in a space and learn together and share together, but not um, disrespect people by uh, by sharing their stuff out side of this space and how can we respect each other in this space too and create uh, room for different voices. So I'll share that too, but I think that um, potentially having some sort of um, some sort of something in the beginning of, of uh, an open mic and having it even just like posted on your um, on your uh, why can't I think of what it's called? It's like not a white flyer and stuff. Oh yeah, the chalkboards. <laughs> the chalkboard, yes. Why can't I think of chalkboard? Uh, because it's so antiquated. Or or flyers <laughs> too. Yeah. Yeah. And you can have some sort of like make maybe that's an ongoing list of community agreements that you um are building on and you put them in the flyers. I think that that's all like um useful. And it might be tutors. Uh, creating those those community agreements mostly just because they exist in that space um, more. But but yeah, I think that um, even though you've built up, you know, the rapport and the and the connection and everything too, I think that revisiting that doesn't hurt. And I think that being really intentional about that and saying, hey, I want to make sure that this is what's going on. Let's do this thing together and being um, so transparent about that, I feel like students really um, react well to that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think any chance I can have to be more intentional is is a good moment. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Thanks for asking that question. Any other questions or things that you all have been doing that have been working or aren't working? Um, or that you've seen other people do that you want to um, highlight? I can make a comment if, if no one else is. Um, I'm so grateful for this presentation. I think it's very, very timely. I think part of what you're discussing with the preparation, I've tried to already do both in my syllabus and my classroom and say up front, look, you guys, this is a contentious time and our society is polarized. And even though that's the case outside of the classroom, when we're in the classroom, we're going to be respectful. We're going to listen, um, but we are not going to use dehumanizing language, etc. My concern and the reason I was coming to this um, is that I recall after the election um, of Trump 
that there were some really hot moments in the classroom where students were actually calling members of other political parties um, idiots, traitors, etc. <clears throat> and um, you know, we had I had had to shut that down pretty quickly and say, well, now we're all entitled to our opinions, but we need to state them respectfully. I don't know. That can it can work. It can go so far, but I I just don't know what's going to happen with this election. And I think they're going to be very very hot discussions and people who are very upset um so i i don't know i i see the need and i'm happy to get any suggestions you can provide for actually handling it in the moment um and then the reflection piece maybe not that same day but later right you're not suggesting that we say okay let's just all stop and reflect on this right now um you could if things are getting really, really bad, it's, I, you know, like, um, I think that it's totally, um, fine to sort of like, be like, okay, we're, we're done with this conversation. We need to reset and you all need to write quietly for 15 minutes, um, and sort of give them a chance to sort of work through their feelings, but also not be attacking each other. Um, especially if it's, you know, the middle of class, if it's like not five minutes before you're going to dismiss them anyway, what are you going to do with that time? Do you dismiss early? Do you give them a chance to, uh, go take a lap around Ravis and then come back? Um, but I think that it, once things get bad, um, it can be really hard to get back on track. And especially if people are holding in those those feelings. Um, so if it feels like reflection later is helpful, that's great. Um, but also they can write out those those feelings in the moment. Um, and then maybe even, okay, uh, take this, revise it, and then share it with me, and we can have conversations. Um, but yeah, I think that sometimes um, redirecting uh, uh, students is helpful. I mean, we talk about it a lot with with like young kids having like tantrums and stuff. But I mean, this is this is true for for people of all ages that if you're having these these uh, large feelings and you're feeling like you need to attack somebody. Um, what can we do to redirect these feelings so that we can feel them, we can get these thoughts out, um, and that we can possibly be productive, and maybe we be productive in a way that is not touching on these topics anymore. Maybe we revisit them in a day or two. Okay. I'm assuming that opening, opening a Blackboard forum and say, okay, guys, well, we're not going to talk about this now, but here's a Blackboard forum. We might have the same issues. So I like your idea of having them write about it and then provide a space where they can post in a way that only the teacher could see what their feelings are and respond to that um, in a way that's individually appropriate. So thanks for that. Yeah, of course. And it's, I, I wish there was like a simple answer that'd be like, you know, do this thing and it's going to be all better. But like, obviously, um, I'm sure a lot of us have been in the situation too, where it's like somebody does something, it's offensive, it irks you, it hurts some, like your feelings or somebody that you uh, care about that you want to protect. And how do we get back? from that. And sometimes you just have to feel those feelings and you um, feel unsafe or you feel on edge. Um, and it's hard then to refocus on um, the things that you're supposed to be learning or the things that you're supposed to be accomplishing. And so I think that making room for being like, hey, this is this is tough. Um, your, your feelings are valid. Um, if we're going to talk about this thing, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way that is going to be productive. Um, 
if you're just going around and calling people names and it's not relevant to class, then this is not helpful. Um, but if we're talking about a particular thing, if we want to be talking about an election, if we want to be talking about, um, you know, uh, situations happening in, um, in other parts of the world, and we're wanting to make sure that we're doing that in a productive way, then maybe we do need to be writing about it first. Maybe we do need to be um, reflecting on it. Uh, maybe you're even having them write one pagers and then they can come and present them um, and they can go through an editing process and uh, work through them so that they have a polished thing that they can present to everybody else. If that feels like that's a good use of their time, but um Sometimes we just got to feel and we just got to feel like we, we're being heard or understood. Um, and uh, I think a lot of that is going to fall on those of us that are instructors and are trying to facilitate that class and trying to manage everything. Um, yeah, any other questions or things that people want to um, share that have worked for you? I will say that I have never uh, had students um, take a five minute break and go walk for this reason. Um, I've done that for other reasons like, oh gosh, we watched this video about this thing that's a really heavy topic, you know, like um, like gendered violence or something. Um, and like, hey, we're in our feelings. Like, let's go, let's break this up. Let's go uh, take a walk, go to the bathroom, go to get a drink, um, go touch grass for five minutes and come back here. And then we can maybe be in a better head space and heart space to talk about these things. And uh, students appreciate that because sometimes you just need to get out of that space and um, get away from the the physical space that that you are, are feeling those emotions in. So uh, that can be really, really useful. Thanks, Ellen. It can be hard, though, if you're teaching a 55-minute class to be like, oh, hey, um, let's let's just like, you know, 15 minutes, let's, uh, you know, go walk around the room or something uh, or the building, whatever that is. Um, but I think that it, sometimes it is it, it's useful, especially for us to move our bodies um, and to encourage students to just breathe air elsewhere. Okay. I, um, what do I do? Oh, uh, I was going to say, that's it. I have some um, resources to share out with all of you. I appreciate you all being here. As questions and concerns come up, as I said, let me know. I'm going to be sending out my contact information um, and we can have one-on-one -on -one chats. You can email me stuff. Um, you can say, oh my gosh, this thing happened in my class. Uh, let me just tell you about it. And I'll listen. Um, I am aware that it's it's a challenging time to have students. And again, whether it's related to what's actively happening in your classroom um, with the things that they're learning, these hot moments are related to them as individuals. And so they're going to be coming up. And whether they're actively talking about it in your class, they're going to be carrying these things, right? Um, so... I think that it's really, really useful to uh, to make space for that, to uh, acknowledge that our feelings are big, um, whether it's an election season or not, and that that's normal and that's human and that's okay. Um, okay, well, thank you all um, for for joining me here today.